Say is thank you to Dr. Carter again for doing this. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank I got, you. I got one full page and two really short pieces. If I get long, somebody holler or throw a book or something. The first one is called Black, White, and Both. It's interesting to listen to people refer to Americans as black or white. It's easy to pretend that our racial makeup as a country is that simple, but it simply isn't true. When our ancestors began bringing Africans into this country around 1619 to become slaves, many male slave owners sired children by slave women, almost always without their consent. The children of these complicated relationships were half white. This practice of siring children with unwilling sexual partners may have had some social embarrassment attached to it, but there was no law designed to provide for individual rights of African women. Thus, these relationships continued over the course of many decades. Even from the early days of our history, occasionally a black man and a white woman had a child together. Family trees were seldom kept. Those that were kept conveniently left out any connection between slave owners and slaves and their offspring. Sadly, the result is that there are few genealogical or legal records to reflect how black and white people have become forever related by blood. But the absence of records does not change the fact that most of us are related to people of the other race. What is odd to me is that many people still choose to separate themselves racially and remain prejudicial as though there really are two unconnected races. In recent times, the families of President Thomas Jefferson and South Carolina Senator Strom Thurmond have had to face up to their blood kinship to African Americans. Would it not be more, more humane, responsible, and even wiser to embrace our blood kinship now and begin developing actual genealogies that link us than to ignore the facts until later? The Bible in John 8.32 says, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If the truth makes us free, what does a lie make us? Now, in the year 2008, obviously I wrote this eight years ago, the Democrat Party nominee for President of the United States is Barack Obama, a child of a Kenyan man and a white American woman from Kansas. He is generally referred to as a black man, but in reality he is not black. Neither is he white. He's both. But most importantly, he's an American. Maybe Barack Obama with his high profile image in the world will serve as a reminder of our common racial ancestry in America. Maybe we will see beyond the color of people's skins and look into their hearts and souls Dr. Martin Luther King wanted us to, and as we should. If we choose to look backward, we're linked to Barack Obama. If we choose to look forward, we're linked to Barack Obama. It is time for all Americans to face these facts. Let's come together as brothers and sisters, black, white, and both. Yes. yes. This one's a whole lot shorter. Should ease you a little bit. This is called Ken to You, and what this is is a condensation or a collection of Clyde Cluckholm's value orientation hypothesis put in the form of a poem. Nobody in this room has ever heard of Clyde Cluckholm's value orientation hypothesis. But now you'll hear something like it, except for the two questions I ask that he never put out. This is called Ken to You. Where do we come from? Where do we go? Most folks wonder, maybe you know. Are we born evil or 
we going good? How can I give you the respect that I should? And how can we learn all the things we should do? Now, would you mind if I be kind to you? What is a relationship really supposed to be when it comes right down to you and me? And how should we treat all the flora and the fauna? How should we express time in our songs? These are the things I've been wondering about. And I reckon I'll wonder till the time I check out. Where do we come from? Where do we go? Most folks wonder. Maybe you know. Now here's one that was in the paper today. If you don't, if you don't believe me, get you an Asheville citizen and read it. Oh, wonderful. Men make their marks. This is the year 2018. America has a decorated, highly respected U.S. Navy pilot who spent six torturous years in a North Vietnamese prison. He's a U.S. Senator from Arizona. Nearing the end of his fight with cancer, John McCain has made his final request known. Demonstrating political respect as well as racial acceptance, he asked George W. Bush, Republican President, and Barack Obama, Democrat and first African American president, to deliver his eulogies. Interestingly, he has explicitly disinvited the current president, Donald Trump. <laughs> what does this mean to and for Americans? What will this signify to veterans? What does Donald Trump think? What does Trump feel? What will Trump do? John McCain has made his mark with courage, sacrifice, and service to America. How will Donald Trump make his mark? following the truth about plumbing. Yes. Um, and for those who don't, uh, haven't been, um, I'm going to read the final paragraph of where I left off so that we can put this in context. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. In plumbing, there is no guessing allowed, no fantasizing, no wishing that things work differently than they actually do. It is either hot or cold, left or right, up or down. It either leaks or it doesn't leak. It is either dry or it is wet. It either drains or it doesn't. It either works or it doesn't work. There is no compromise with the reality of the situation. This is the state of mind that is drilled and cemented into the core being of a plumber. If you wish to seek an opinion that is void of delusional thinking, the right person to ask is a plumber. <laughs> this does not preclude, however, a capacity for innovation and the use of imagination. Although the plumber's mind is trapped within the limitations of strict physical realities, he or she is often required to create solutions to paradoxical and seemingly insurmountable obstacles. Take, for instance, the case of needing to make a solder joint repair to a frozen burst copper pipe at the lowest point in the cold water supply system under a house. A solder joint cannot be sealed where there is any moisture present in the pipe. This is because the tin antimony alloy used to solder copper pipes coated with flux has a melting point of 460 degrees Fahrenheit. But water in liquid form, when heated under normal atmospheric pressure, will not get hotter than 212 degrees, regardless of how long you hold a torch to it, thereby preventing the metals from achieving their necessary melting and bonding points. So, the pipe and repair fittings must be kept absolutely bone dry during the soldering process. The problem is, 
Since this is the lowest place in the entire plumbing system of the building, all the water in the house is slowly draining directly to this point. It could take hours, days, or weeks for every drop of water to finally drain and for these pipes to be dry and repairable. You can't stuff a rag or some other absorbent material inside the pipe to temporarily stop the dripping because once you seal the pipe, the rag's still in there and the water won't flow. Okay? The modern miracle of wonder bread. White bread may exacerbate diabetes and play havoc with the health of those who limit themselves to a gluten-free diet. But it can't be totally coincidental that this highly processed refined carbohydrate came into global prominence during roughly the same period of human history and evolution as the modern copper plumbing system. <laughs> because plumbers could not survive without white bread. By manually compressing and stuffing a wad of white bread a few inches into a stagnant, stagnant copper pipe, with the water pressure turned off, the few minutes of absolute dryness necessary to solder a joint will be provided. Then, when the water pressure is turned back on, the bread dissolves and the problem is resolved. It may be necessary to go around the house removing all the screens on the tips of faucet spouts and flushing them out, but basically white bread works with no permanent damage to the plumbing system. It also works when PVC and CPVC pipes have to be kept dry for gluing. In extreme circumstances when white bread is not available, a light wheat bread can be used. <laughs> But heavier whole grains are problematic due to high fiber content, subsequently clogging sensitive valve screens and filters in the plumbing system. Neither are, are, neither are these hardier varieties blessed with the same water absorbing properties as Wonder White. If white Wonder style bread ever ceases to exist because the population becomes so health conscious <laughs> that there is no longer a viable market for its production, we will simultaneously lose the ability to repair broken frozen copper and glue type plastic water pipes. <laughs> Such is the deep ecology of the modern world and the interactive nature of its seemingly unrelated parts. In that vein, there are unforeseen, unforeseen consequences that can arise from the storage and use of white bread for plumbing, such as the time during a drought-stricken lean year when a desperately hungry black bear came down out of the hills into my yard at night and rocked my van back and forth trying to break in and steal a loaf I had left on the passenger seat. Now, as far as we know, bears know nothing about plumbing. And this was, I am certain, just looking for a meal. This one was looking for a meal. But the universal consciousness sometimes works in strange and indirect ways. Irrefutably, the bear, knowingly or not, delivered yet another reminder of the trouble we run into when vainly and futilely trying to manipulate the natural order of things. burning down the house. Water, being the dense liquid matter it is, conducts electricity very well. For this reason, it is always a very bad idea to combine these two elements or to even keep them in close proximity to each other. Yet, modern living dictates we do exactly that. Sinks with garbage disposals, automatic dishwashers, clothes washers, water heaters, and an assortment of other clever, convenient gadgets require 110 or 220 volts with substantial amperage to come within a hair's breadth of the water supply and or drainage system. At, as long as the plumbing remains intact with no leakage, these devices seemingly work well, benignly performing their tasks and making life easier for us. But water, water heating tanks, disposal housings, washing machine drums, gaskets, washers, pipes, and fittings eventually rust through, wearing out from vibration, corrosion, or, or deteriorate in some fashion, 
and the free spirit of H2O inevitably escapes its prison. We deceive ourselves into believing there are foolproof safeguards built into the system. We rely on circuit breakers, fuses, or ground fault circuits to save the day, and sometimes they do for a while. But over a period of years of inactivity, moisture will scale, pit, and blister metal components within a safety switch, rendering it frozen and ineffective. This, of course, remains undiscovered until it fails when most needed. The pipes in the crawl space under your house are exposed and vulnerable to freezing in the winter, even though they are racked with pipe insulation. If a long cold snap hits your neighborhood while you are vacationing in Florida during Christmas, those pipes are history because they'll be sitting stagnantly with no one home using water. They'll lose more and more heat each hour until they freeze solid and break open from ice expansion. So you have a great idea to address this potential disaster. Why not wrap those pipes in electric heat tape and then cover them with foam insulation? What could go wrong? The day comes when an ice storm hits in the middle of winter and the power goes out for three days. The heat tape, of course, is useless without electricity. The pipes freeze and break. The power comes back on days later. The heat tape is re-energized and gets hot. The weather warms, the pipes thaw, but now some of the pipes that were wrapped with heat tape are empty because they have uh, they've been broken and separated from the water source. If the pipes are plastic, PVC, CPVC, polybutylene, or cross-linked polyethylene, the heat tape will melt them, and eventually they will burst into flame at a relatively <laughs> low temperature. Even if the pipes are metal, they no longer contain water to cool the electric element in the heat tape, which causes the tape's rubber jacket to melt, exposing the raw wires and igniting the pipe insulation. And then your house burns down. <laughs> you can possibly prevent this from happening if you're planning a winter trip and you have the foresight to pump non-toxic propylene glycol antifreeze into all the pipes. But if the ice storm power outage happens to occur when unexpected, to occur unexpectedly while you're at home with mere water in the pipes, there could be trouble unless you have the timely knowledge, wisdom, and memory to go under the house and unplug the heat tape during a deep freeze, which is completely counterintuitive. There is no adequate answer to this conundrum. This is just one example of how your plumbing system can burn down the house. With some ingenuity and imagination, it's entirely possible to envision other potential scenarios that would achieve the same. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Woo -hoo. I always learn from you, Avram. It's <laughs> never anything good. <laughs> Mr. Baker. Thank Mr. Baker. You, thank you, thank you. Uh, let's don't burn the house down. <laughs> and uh, just to say that my wife did not hit me in the eye, like I've been telling a lot of people. She just threw the stick at me and it hit me down. So. <laughs> she just what? She what? She threw a stick at him. Yeah. <laughs> You're not going to tell the story. <laughs> All right. This is going yeah. on Mountain Street TV. <laughs> <laughs> okay, as most of you know, I've been reading from this little memoir of my life here. Uh, the focal point is to get into Vietnam, and that, that's where we're at. So. Uh, uh, I'm about a little past mid-tour here, uh, and I'm, I'm a door gunner at this particular time. It was the first night, the first cab. Uh, a few days after I came back from R&R &R in November, Colonel Rusi informed us that an Arvin patrol had walked into an ambush set up by a trolley troop up near Loch Ninn. This area was near the fishhook area where so much NVA movement was taking place coming across from Cambodia. The damn Arvins hadn't notified any American units of their presence, but it didn't matter. Three men were K KIA and several more wounded. The Arvin commander of that region was mad as hell and wanted money for his men's <coughs> family. 
I'm not sure, but he probably wanted some for himself also. That was how some of them operated. Colonel Rusi was short. He would be heading home in less than two weeks, and he didn't need this shit, but he was in it. We flew into the Arvin headquarters, and Rusi spoke to us. It was serious. If I'm not back in 30 minutes, or if you hear gunshots, get the hell out of here. Warrant Officer Copilot nodded. I told you I was terrible with names. I can't remember what his name was. Me and the crew chief locked and loaded while the blades continued to spin. Rusi walked into the headquarters building with a sack of money just as six or eight Arban troops walked out with their weapons. They marched over to within 30 feet of our chopper. It wasn't an orderly like a wasn't orderly like a firing squad, but they lined up pointing their weapons dead at me and the co-pilot. I normally fly left door, but for that day I was flying right door and I don't remember why. I was right behind the co-pilot when I heard over the helmet. You see that, Baker? Yes, sir, I've got it. I answered, slamming around into the chamber. All I could do was sight down the barrel of my 60 and hope like hell that if the shooting started, they wouldn't hit the co-pilot or we were just dead meat. The Mexican standoff lasted for about 20 minutes before Rusi came out of the headquarters building, glanced over at the Arvins, who still had their weapons pointed at us, and then crawled into the chopper. When the dust started swirling, the Arvins broke up their formation and headed back towards the building. We got the hell out of there. I never heard any mention of that episode around H Troop. I never heard anybody talk about it either. Colonel Rusi left a few days later and another lieutenant colonel named James Patterson took his place, Peterson. Evidently, all the light colonels in the first cab were a little crazy and Peterson was no exception. He liked to fly low too. After a couple of days of getting oriented with RAO, Peterson was ready to go. I remembered one operation name, Operation Tong Tong Two. Started about mid-November near the Michelin Plantation just north of the Iron Triangle. And what that meant in Vietnamese, I have no idea. We were flying CNC. The Arbans were pouring out across the Mekong River from Cambodia and Alpha Troop along with part of Bravo Troop caught the bastard moving in broad daylight. We were in a fight. The C-1, or the CH-47, or Chinook, is an important piece of military hardware, but it is big and gangly. The Alpha Troop CO had called for resupply and medevac of two KIAs and two wounded grunts. We watched from about 500 feet as the Chinook lumbered in and started to touch down. Suddenly, all hell broke loose. The Chinook went down hard. People and supplies scattered everywhere. It was a mess. Peterson called for a couple of medevacs out of Tain Inn Field Hospital and in about 15 minutes they were circling the fight area. Now most of the medevac pilots were as courageous as any of the regular pilots, but the two we got that day circled the fight several times watching the ship fly and told Peterson they weren't going in. It was way too hot. Peterson cursed, but there was nothing he could do. Hell, those were my boys down there, and we're going in. Came the call over the helmet. Down we went. The Arvins had been emboldened when they shot the Chinook down, and the fight was getting heavy. Shit was flying everywhere as we slid in beside the Chinook wreckage. See if you can help, Baker, came the call. I was already unhooking my flight helmet. I jumped down and ran over to help get a couple of the badly shook up and wounded crew members out of the Chinook. The grunt slid the two KIAs onto the chopper that Peterson kept at full throttle while I helped the crew on board. One point that I need to make here is that when you unhook your flight helmet, you leave it on, all outside noise is muffled. It gives you a weird feeling of kind of being there but kind of not in the fight, disconnected. It's not a good feeling. I got the wounded onto the chopper, reconnected my flight helmet, and got my 60 ready. The two KIAs were staring into nothingness as we pulled out. The crew chief 60 and my 60 were smoking hot as shells fell amongst the living and the dead. When we reached the field hospital, we gently offloaded the dead first, and then the wounded, and headed back to the fight. The battalion XO put the Colonel Peterson in for a silver star, which he got. They didn't quite they didn't seem quite sure what to do with me and the crew chief, so they gave us a bronze star, and that's another story. 
as I have said before, not every fight was a big fight, but if you're in the fight, it's big enough. On another note, some of my friends, and you may know him, Gary Boyer was a crew chief, was a 227. Uh, he lives here. Uh, he worked out of Tainan, and Arthur Wade uh, out of Swain County. He was a grunt FO with the 9th Infantry. He got three Purple Hearts. Those guys have good memories. They can remember people's names and operations names, but I, I'm not, I can't do that, I'm not that well. Sometime in early January of 69, I'm flying with two guys in the B-model gunship again. A Special Forces compound was getting hit over near the Mekong River. And we got a call to put fire on the NBA and the VC who were hammering the compound. We had to really watch where we fired, where our fire was directed because Charlie Troop was fighting its way into the compound. One of the many tricks the NBA used is spider holes. Small, small, sometimes one person pits covered with debris. The gooks would stay hidden until the grunts walked past them and then pop up and shoot the troops in the back. Charlie Troop was wise to these tri tricks and asked us to fly a little behind their advance. We were nose down at about 100 feet when I spotted this NBA crawl out of a spider hole. Now the grunts had just passed that spot and I think the gook was trying to slip away, but it was a mistake. My 60 chased him down and tore his ass apart. Another macabre dance. Co-pilot and the crew chief, the co-pilot on the crew chief side even stuck his 357 out and was firing out the window. Crazy guy. Charlie Troop kicked ass and after about an hour things calmed down. We had refueled and were flying in a big loop over the compound to keep an eye on things. When a call came in for a medevac, the answer from the field hospital that it would be 30 minutes before anybody could get in there. Hell, we were right there. But it was a B model. No lift capacity. We talked amongst ourselves. We'd expended all with about 200 rounds, and we were down to three rounds in uh, the 40 mic mic. Uh, we were fairly light, so we dropped down into the compound next to the headquarters bunker. We barely touched down when four guys came raining out towards us with two stretchers loaded with wounded. One was a black guy, the other a white guy. As I've told you before, race didn't mean shit in the bush, but years later, I remember how the blood from both guys mixed and dripped off the edge of the chopper. It was the same damn color. A life lesson. The 69 Tet was nothing compared to the 68 Tet, but, uh, but Chuck raised us a bunch of hell. He hit us, hit our chopper area with mortars and rockets nearly every night. I had a new crew chief with him, a kid from somewhere in Iowa by the name of Beck. He was a pretty decent crew chief, but God, he was homesick. He had a girlfriend, and she was all he talked about. There had been a couple of sappers that got into the wire and blew up some of our choppers. So we'd been tasked with sleeping on the colonel's chopper at night, two-hour shifts. Beck had just relieved me, and although he looked kind of long-faced, I didn't think much about it. I just plopped down on my cot back at the hooch when I heard a shot. It was fairly muffled, but it was close. A 60 round. I sprinted out to our chopper with my M16 and found two guys helping Beck out the side door. He was holding his hand. Come to find out, Beck had shot his trigger finger off. Now, normally losing a finger wouldn't get you sent home, but when you shoot yourself, that's not good. He'd gotten a Dear John letter from that girl back home he talked about so much. He went home on a Section 8. That shit stays with you. Sad, real sad. A couple of nights later, I'm standing outside our hooch, <coughs> taking a leap, and we get hit. Not a very heroic incident, that this is the truth. <laughs> it was monsoon season, and that's what saved me. The first rocket hit, first rocket in hit about 20 feet from me, just across the road. Luckily, hitting a ditch would absorb the shrapnel, but I got hit with a blast, which blew me sideways. I had turned to my right a little, evidently, when I heard the rocket coming in. I was heading for the bunker. The force of the blast knocked me up against the bunker and nearly knocked me out. My right shoulder slammed my sandbag, and it's still a little messed up to this day. The worst thing was the concussion. It nearly blew out my left ear. My ear bled, my damn head rang for several minutes. Crawled into the bunker and lay there. You okay, Baker? Someone asked. Yeah, man, I'm okay, but my head's pounding. I can't hear very well. 
I never went to the infirmary, I just sucked it up. Years later at the VA hospital, the audiologist asked me why I didn't go to the infirmary that day. Because I had no record of the injury. Ma'am, you just didn't whine about small shit back then, my answer. 45 years later, I got 10% disability. I never told them about being sprayed with Agent Orange. What good would it have done? Could have been worse. I got two of them, they're short enough, but the first one is someone I thought I would never be able to do because of how their music career has spawned and how long it's been and just, you can't really use too many of the very obvious things. And also, it just sounds a little too creepy. Not, not exactly in a bad way, just like, really? I said, well, so you might need to get him a babysitter. Okay, here's the first one. Let's face it, we all dare to be stupid to pass the time. That's one big cake and we want to eat it as much as possible. Not to mention everyone wants one more minute of fame. Yet we all live in normalcy, where the good old days are gone. This is life for someone, but get real people as we want to have fun. We don't earn money for nothing outside of taking it easy. And so even the biggest ball of twine in Minnesota has ample excitement. Let me choose to stay far out of the fun zone that isn't theirs. They spend most of the days getting fat from doing nothing else, getting tons of spam while finding something among the static, claiming to be the ma magic of cable TV going every moment of the day. It's, al it's almost like watching weird animals living in the fridge, stuck in the traffic jam called life. That n never truly gets better. I hate to say it, but everything I know is wrong. Things come and go faster than a radiant midnight star. So, so you can't be a couch potato every waking moment. So even taking a little time at trash day is the first step of recovery. So the change of the channel is closed, but no cigar, as there's more to do with so much boredom. Germs take over and spread like wildfire. It's not a total system failure at Jurassic Park. I can't believe my own eyes when one of these loafers die. Still. And they're inactive but very content in creepy state, meaning another rides the bus to some odd afterlife where being a goober isn't fatal. So I personally, I, I personally take the nature trail to hell just to keep things interesting. I suppose my life is good enough for now, but I, but I won't change. It feels like I'm another soul paying the alimony of life while being caught up in a twister that never lands in a nice spot. So why can't someone bite me just to see if I'm awake? So I'm not looking for an ode to a superhero wall of flames. Let's face it, I'm a white nerdy guy who's proud of it. So and we can do whatever you like to pass the time, but nothing that will make the headline news. Anyone want to take a guess at that one? Isn't that not Weird Al? Yes. Yeah. That's Weird Al Yankovic. Possibly one of the greatest um, songwriters ever just because he <laughs> makes everything just sound so much better <laughs> after all he almost got killed over doing white and nerdy which sounds so much better than white and nerdy because you actually can understand him here's another one meant for an older generation just because of how long this guy starts and when you probably guess who it is yes this is you'll probably guess the source of how I got involved with this person and no I will not do the thing that will come next Trust me. Don't trust Fate. She's a lady that will lead you astray every time. Nothing more than a daughter of darkness trying to drag you into the depths. All starting with a poison kiss, stealing away all the joy under her veil of bliss. I remember when the world was beautiful and full of life like a dream. Little by little, the wrong people came. I pitched black hearts full of greed, only wanting to help themselves through any ounce of hope meant for healing. I guess it's that old black magic wanting to have its fun. Someday there might be a sign the world is getting better, but without love, no one can ever step into the light of happiness. For now, we're all stuck with the face of a loser disguised as contentment. Even a field of yellow daisies lacks the glory of its true freedom, still remaining out of reach as someone gets there before everyone else. 
why are, why are people so afraid to stand together and help make life a little better? I suppose the elusive dreams will always remain un unattainable, and we all s say goodbye as people like me don't get many chances in life. So sometimes we cry as nothing else feels right for too long. The younger days of, inner, of ignorance have gone and replaced by harsh reality. Even strange things don't have as much excitement anymore. Once upon a time, everyone had a few moments of hope for the future. With the green and grass of home almost alive in the morning sun, stretching on endlessly over this, uh, <clears throat> the depressing cityscapes like a dream. And however, like a thunderbolt, everything fades away in a flash. And so, these things you don't forget as we want the dream to return. So my foolish heart yearns to escape this dreary place and never return. We all want a taste of honey from the flower of serenity while bathing in the cool water lying beyond the sea on the horizon. Yet we remain here trying to enjoy a brief sunny afternoon. We can't help ourselves wanting a better life that may never may come. One that comes with the chills and fevers that dist distract from misery. All, all we do, all we can do is keep lingering on, waiting for a glimmer of gold. From 16 tons of human filth trying to hide any chance to flee. It's been a long time coming for a miracle to, for any miracle to grace us. I said, where do you belong in this ever-growing chaotic world? Are you looking for peace or to make more people unhappy? I said, I've got a heart that wants to spread joy and love to all I meet. Like the first rose in a garden ready to provide beauty among the green. I said, it's not unusual to spend the better part of life um, forever waiting to do this. However, it takes a worried man to show that, show others that things need to change. If you need me, I'm here whenever you feel down and can't go on alone. And we'll leave the dimming of the day to find a brighter tomorrow. So that where no one becomes the puppet man of some evil fool, so we can hear that wonderful sound that comes from being free. So that, and said, only once we leave the gloom behind can we find something better. So if you're tired of being alone, and said, I said, come with me and don't be afraid. Lean on me, and I said, so I can gain strength in the heart. So then we can make the impossible dream finally real. Well, there's no guarantee of how long this process will take. Give me a chance to show you that the world isn't beyond saving. Just know we have to go quick as there are margins behind us. Anyone want to take a guess? Really? Tom Jones. The last part was a reference to Mars Attacks where, despite all the chaos, even the Martians wanted to jam with him. When well, you say 16 tons, I was thinking Tennessee Ernie Ford. <laughs> no. You ain't that old even though no. he is. Yeah. No, but in this case, I got involved with him watching The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and oh. I will not do the Carlton dance. I cannot do that. I don't have that kind of thing. It Good. Be all for the best. Yeah. yeah. That's just right. what it should be. Yep. All right, thank you very much. Thank wow. you. <laughs> Sir. Whoa! Dairy, dairy. Oh, wrong show. <laughs> okay, I, uh... <clears throat> you can read from there if you would prefer. I've always been a little uncomfortable in here because uh, I'm not a writer in the sense of you uh, no, what are you all what was uh, it? Uh, I'm a playwright. I've always felt that I, my, my place was on the stage, and uh, my only success has been with, with plays. But I've been thinking lately, why don't I mix them up a little bit? Uh, <coughs> maybe part drama, part writing, part poetry, part film, whatever. Anyway, I've got something here, yeah, you know, uh, pacify me, make me feel that it's significant. I'm going to pass these out and I don't want you to open them until I get ready. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. There 
everybody's got one. Okay, it's just two pages. All right, it's really just a page and a half. Open them. You look younger then. Last night I dreamed I had a visitor. It was a little six-year-old kid in his new overhauls with his shirt buttoned up all the way because that was what his grandmother did. Buttoned him up to go off to school. It was a timid knock and when I opened the door he said, can I come in? I said, sure kid. Come on in. And he did. He stood for a moment just inside the door and then he said, I used to live here. He crossed the room and peered at my computer with suspicion. Where's Mama's couch? I remembered then that he called his grandmother Mama and his grandfather Papa, and he pointed to my book-laden desk and said, that's where Papa used to sit on Sunday morning and listen to Renfro Valley. He always had his tuning fork and he would hit it on his knee and then he'd hold it to his ear and he'd say, do 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 He gave me a fleeting smile. Then he peered anxiously into the kitchen. I was afraid he was going to ask me where Mama and Papa were, but he didn't. I think he knew. I suddenly looked at this small, fragile boy and felt sorrow for all the pain and shock that he would encounter. In less than a year, he would have polio. He would spend six weeks in Mama's bed and would wait to hear his grandparents whispering about him. But he survived, except one leg was an inch shorter than the other. It didn't matter because he could run like the wind, he could run from the pasture to the house, he could jump the rail fence and mama's boxwoods and once in school when a mentally deranged teacher beat him until he was unconscious. Her only explanation being he missed the bus and he had to walk to school and when he got there, the hall door was locked, and he shut the door, and the crazy teacher descended on him like an avenging fury, and afterwards, the only explanation she ever gave was, he came to school late and slammed the door. But he would thrive in school. The bad times came in high school, and suddenly he said, I gotta go. Somebody's waiting for me. And when I looked into the dark yard, I saw a figure standing under the old June apple tree, a tree that had been gone now for 50 years. And it looked like the figure had a guitar. And the kid smiled at me. Maybe I'll come back sometime, he said. Yeah, you do that. He turned to go, and then he paused. And he turned and said, maybe when I come back, you can go with me when I leave. I felt a cold but pleasant chill spread down my back. There was a white pause before I answered, but then I said, yeah, maybe, maybe I will do that. And the kid smiled then, that wonderful winsome smile. And then he was gone running like the wind, running. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I want to make an announcement, but I, I've had an organization called Liars Bench. This guy actually came to it last time, yeah. <laughs> and I have a storytelling workshop coming up in this room on the 27th. There's information out at the front desk. 
uh, the Liars Bench is on the 17th up at uh, WCU. I've been doing it up there a long time. Uh, I'm tickled about the next one because we're going to deal with Hetty West. I don't know if that means anything to anybody. She was a folk singer, wrote 500 miles, attended Western Carolina, didn't like it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Starting on page three, um, because she read the beginning of this last time.